Department of Health, and then KZN Department of Finance and Economy, uh, Economic Development. So that's briefly, uh, we know him very well. Uh, so the next uh, person I want to introduce is Professor Shabi. Uh, Madi is our professor here at Vets uh, uh, in Vaccinology. Uh, he's a, 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 a scientist uh, in this field, and uh, he's been uh, very well known in the field of uh, vaccinology, and uh, he's also been a director of world-renowned Medical Research Council, Vaccine and Infectious Disease Analytics Research Unit, and uh, he's been very much also involved in these discussions and uh, throughout the, this vaccine debate, we've seen him on, on in the public domain. Again, I'm not going to read all his CV. And the next one is Mr. Kess Kuavadi, well known in the business settles, CEO of Business Unity South Africa. Kess has uh, been around the block for many, many years in the business uh, association. He's been the managing director of banking association and is a chairperson of National Business Unit. He's, really de- he's also on the board of Center of for Development and Enterprise. He's dedicated his life uh, in, in really improving business organization, business association, particularly cooperation between business and government. And especially uh, in this pandemic, we have seen tremendous amount of cooperation of business and government. The next one is Ron, Dr. Ron Willen. And uh, he's the Chief Commercial Officer of Discovery Health. He's also a medical doctor by training. Uh, and he's been an associate partner in McKinsey. And he led the whole healthcare practice of McKinsey in Sub-Sahara. Very well known in the space of health sector. And he's also been involved in health sector, in healthcare investments. And finally, uh, I call him a bra, Stavros, uh, Senior Executive Strategic Trade Development at Aspen Pharma Care Group. Uh, Stavros uh, is a, a group of senior executive responsible for strategic trade development and previously was the CEO of Aspen Export Unit. And uh, Aspen, as we know, is, is Africa's largest pharmaceutical manufacturer and now the leader in anesthetics and injectable anticoagulants. So, he, he, and Aspen is a global organization, and he's been leading uh, uh, from, from Aspen's point of view and, and also uh, in BUSA uh, and, and Business South Africa uh, in, in, in this whole area of, of COVID-19. So we've got a v- people who are experts in the field and who have really uh, been involved practically involved. And that's what we want to drive here at Business School is to bring the academic and the, and the business school together. So, uh, Minister, uh, the questions I've already indicated to you, so I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Prof, uh, and all the panelists, esteemed panelists, and to all the participants. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, one of the questions you raised was uh, just to look at some of the lessons from the last year and we were dealt with the um, COVID-19. Uh, I'll highlight a few, but there are many. I think the one of the issues that we have realized is the need for us to build a resilient and very sustainable health system, uh, in our case, based on the national health insurance, because the response that you may, you have onto such crises and emergencies does depend on how well your system was operating before the op- uh, advent of the pandemic. So I think if there's anything we need to do is to move in the direction of building that resilience, uh, which uh, well, there are a few lessons as well on how public, private <clears throat> uh, could cooperate in trying to move on to um, move to a future where there's a bit more collaboration. The second issue that I thought is important is that um, we need a, a, a campaign to fight the pandemic it needs to be based on science. Uh, so that the science therefore guides all the information we share and all the responses we make. And at the end of the day, uh, whatever happens, it must be uh, you know, uh, referable back to the science and the research that would have been done so that we all can follow because it's very easy to fall for the myths and also get people to disbelieve certain things. And therefore it makes the leadership to be easily affected. The third aspect is that with that information, 
There needs to be a very clear plan of communication so that uh, we're always sharing the information. Uh, the situation is a fast evolving situation which uh, requires new information to be shared and as soon as it, got, it does get shared, and of course people can understand why decisions are taken. And fourthly is the need for bold, united, strong leadership, which is both government and all the civil society, business, labor, uh, and uh, traditional religious. All of these are very important because at the end of it, you want to get the community to respond. And in, to, in, to, in responding, everyone must make their own contribution. But at the same time, there are many voices that should be able to carry the same message. So that's the one thing. The last point that I think uh, one of the lessons we have learned is uh, we need to ensure that South Africa is uh, biotechnically independent and is capable of producing uh, most of its own needs, uh, uh, or particularly pharmaceutical manufacturing and some of the products that we might need. When we started the uh, COVID-19 situation, we had uh, estimation of about 10% of the stuff that was available in South Africa. The rest had to come from outside. So whenever all the countries decided to uh, you know, withhold some of the supplies, we started feeling the pressure. So that for me would be the area of the lessons. The just two questions, two comments uh, is that uh, at this point, <coughs> we have uh, started, <coughs> excuse me, we have started with the uh, program of our vaccine. <coughs> and at this point, uh, up till last night, we had done over 70,000. There's still a very, very small number compared to the 1.5 that we million that we need uh, to ultimately reach towards, uh, in terms of health workers, three phases that we have put up. The first phase is <clears throat> mainly health workers. The next phase is going to be all frontline workers and the rest of the people who are actually uh, serving community on a frontline basis and those with comorbidities. So that angle is going to require us to have more and more um, uh, vaccines. And then, of course, the last one would be for everyone. So we, we're coming on well. But uh, one of the things I can say about the vaccine acquisition or procurement process, it's a very fluid area. I don't believe we could have done anything very differently. What's important is to still engage everybody and participate in such a way that you try and get the best advantage for your situation. So, um, you know, what you find today is the situation will be different tomorrow and the conditions that are involved require a lot of consultation and negotiation. So it remains a fairly fluid situation up to where we are, as President has indicated, we've had to use a number of uh, areas of conduct, talking through COVAX, talking through the AU platform, talking bilaterally, and trying to work out what is the best that we can do in this situation. So that is what I would say <clears throat> at this point, that we believe that uh, public and private sector will have some work to do together. I think that uh, particularly at the level of logistics and deliveries, we should be able to work together with private sector because most of the procurement is going to be done through government, but then uh, private sector should be able to access vaccines through the government program. So that is it. Uh, thank you very much. Let me if we can just hold it at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. We really appreciate your opening remarks. Um, so I will go to Prof. Prof. Shabi. Uh, so thank you and good afternoon, Minister, and uh, good afternoon to everyone else that has joined. So uh, I think where we are in South Africa is that the past month has been a bit of a roller coaster ride uh, in that, as we know, we got the vaccines that were coming out from AstraZeneca, which we were ready, just about ready to start rolling out. And then we got some results from the AstraZeneca vaccine trial in South Africa, which indicated that the vaccine does not actually protect against mild and moderate infection. And I think I need to qualify that in that the study that we did uh, doesn't address as to whether this AstraZeneca vaccine would protect against a uh, severe disease. Now, the implications of this uh, doesn't just resonate within South Africa, but it really resonates globally, because uh, I think we would be naive in believing that a variant that evolved in South Africa hasn't actually dispersed through most of Southern Africa. And in fact, currently there's close to 35 countries uh, where this particular variant has already been identified. And in many of those countries, uh, this variant uh, basically has now seeded and there's community transmission. Uh, in addition to that, what we also see uh, occurring in the United States is evolution of a completely different variant, uh, which shares a lot of similarities to the South African variant in that it is very likely also to be relatively, resist relatively resistant uh, to this first generation of COVID-19 vaccines that have been developed. 
Now, because of this evolution of the virus, uh, which came somewhat unexpected in that, although we do, we did always believe that the virus was going to evolve. I don't think many scientists expected it to evolve as quickly as it did, especially in terms of key components, which are very sensitive to the vaccine induced immunity. Now, where we stand globally is that right now there's a focus in terms of developing a second generation of COVID-19 vaccines, uh, some of which are basically looking at including uh, the South African variant as a bivalent formulation, which means two components in the same vaccine, and others that are looking at uh, more vaccines that will be less sensitive to this sort of mutations that take place. But those sort of vaccines are probably not going to materialize uh, at least until the third quarter of this year. So where that leaves us, uh, in my opinion, in South Africa is that we really need to recalibrate uh, both our, the way in which we approach the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, our response to it, as well as recalibrate our expectations of COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, in the current situation and with the type of vaccines that we do have available to us, and this doesn't just apply to South Africa, it applies to many other countries, the notion of us being able to achieve herd immunity, which is something that, was, uh, that we were aspiring to just a few weeks uh, ago, unfortunately, that is unlikely to materialize uh, because whether it be the J&J vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, all of these vaccines are going to have a knock a knockout effect in terms of the ability to actually uh, prevent uh, or at least protect significantly against mild and moderate infection. Uh, in fact, right now, there's only a single vaccine uh, which has shown any sort of efficacy in a clinical space against mild infection, and that is a Novavax vaccine. And I'm referring specifically to the variant that's circulating in South Africa. So it's extremely unlikely uh, that we're going to get to herd immunity through vaccination, unfortunately. But that itself is not a disaster. I think what we need to come to appreciate is that COVID-19 is not something that's going to go away, uh, even if we have a next generation of vaccine. COVID-19 is here to stay uh, for the rest of our lifetimes, probably. Uh, the focus really needs to be centered around trying to minimize severe disease uh, so that we can protect our healthcare services and to try to reduce the number of people that die of COVID-19. So that again uh, really requires a recalibration. Uh, so as an example, the rollout of vaccines that's currently taking uh, place amongst healthcare workers is being somewhat uh, non-discriminatory in that it allows for any healthcare worker to come forward to be vaccinated, which to some extent uh, needs to happen. But at the same time, we need to be somewhat uh, reflective in terms of exactly what we will gain with that sort of a strategy, as opposed to specifically targeting healthcare workers that are at high risk of developing severe disease or dying of COVID-19. Uh, as we know, the number of vaccines that are becoming available are fairly limited to healthcare workers. And what we can't afford to occur is for us to basically allow the first comers and leave a large percentage of healthcare workers that are at risk of developing severe disease unvaccinated, at least until uh, the next resurgence arrives. Now, the big question that we face as a country, uh, as the president announced uh, yesterday, last night, uh, it's very likely that South Africa will start getting substantial quantities of vaccine uh, around about April and early May. Uh, the challenge that we face is that based on the lifting of some of the restrictions and in particular mass gatherings, as well as what is we likely to experience during the Easter period, in all likelihood, we will experience a resurgence uh, as we head into the cooler months of the year, or because of the increase in terms of allowing of mass gatherings, which lends itself to super spreader events, as well as in a context that as we head into the cooler months of the year, people are more likely to gather indoors in poorly ventilated areas. Uh, consequently, my estimate would be that we're likely to experience a resurgence in South Africa towards the end of May, uh, June, but it might occur earlier if uh, we allow for massive uh, mass gatherings to take place over the Easter period. So that is really going to influence the timelines. Now, the other big unknown in terms of a resurgence is whether the virus will undergo even further evolution, which makes it uh, even more resistant to the first generation of COVID-19 vaccines that are available. So all of those factors would really influence the timing as well as the magnitude of the next resurgence. 
Uh, but what I believe needs to happen is we need to plan for a resurgence that might well start around about May, June. And considering uh, the timelines that we anticipate for when vaccines would become available, we need to reflect in terms of what tools we've currently got available and what sort of, uh, what sort of chances are we wanting to take. As an example, are we wanting to keep the high-risk groups unvaccinated, uh, at least until the resurgence is upon us? Or do we want to take a chance of perhaps even rolling out the AstraZeneca vaccine, which from a biological perspective, there's every reason to believe that it will actually protect against severe disease, uh, even if it didn't protect against mild infection. So the toss-up that we've got is basically rolling out a vaccine that might be available if it hasn't already been passed on to another country, uh, getting people that are at high risk to volunteer to be able to get it if they want. And the worst case scenario is one where the vaccine doesn't work, which means that when another vaccine becomes available, those same individuals get boosted. But on the other hand, leaving them unprotected until the resurgence is upon us essentially means that we are going to again suffer a massive number of cases as well as uh, death uh, from COVID-19. So I think it's important for us to reflect. And the bottom line really is an absolute need to recalibrate our understanding of the pandemic in terms of how we respond to it and our understanding of what we can actually achieve with COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, like I said right at the start, uh, the notion of getting to herd immunity with COVID-19 vaccines, at least for this first generation of COVID-19 vaccines, is extremely slim. Uh, and we would need to have a very different sort of vaccine to be able to interrupt transmission, especially in a context where the variant that's currently circulating in South Africa makes up more than 95% of all of the infections that are taking place. So recalibration in terms of our mindset as to what you can achieve when it comes to the transmission of the virus, as well as what we can achieve uh, in relation to the immunization of individuals with a COVID-19 vaccine is something that's uh, essential. And then the last part, which before I sign off, is really speaking to the issue in terms of why we are facing what we're facing. And that is uh, the African continent largely being the only continent where there hasn't been a single investigational vaccine that has gone into human trials. And this, unfortunately, is not a problem of government. This is a manifestation of a failure on the part of academia, on the part of the private sector, as well as on the part of uh, the public sector in terms of underinvestment in the field of research and in the field of manufacture, which outside of the pandemic situation, unfortunately, is not massively profit generating. So what we're experiencing, unfortunately, might well lead, lend itself to what we experienced in 2009 with a swine flu pandemic, in that the swine flu pandemic vaccine only became available to South Africa and some, a few other countries on the African continent after the pandemic was declared to have passed. Uh, and this is really, that should have been a wake-up call for what was required on the African continent. It wasn't and hopefully a hard lessons will have been learned this time around. Thank you very much, Prof, for quite very uh, powerful statements that you've made there, particularly the fact that the vaccine is going to be around, it's going to be, uh, be here, like all the, the virus is going to be around and uh, we need to, 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 to learn how to navigate our life through it. So thank you very much for those uh, 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 powerful words. Um, now let's move on to broadcast. Uh, that's over to you. Well, Maurice. Now, thank you. And, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, so let me just talk a little bit to the role that organized business is playing currently uh, in support of government to ensure that we get as many vaccines as possible into the country. And that means looking at the different types of vaccines available and those are that are efficacious, getting them into the arms of people as quickly as possible, starting with healthcare workers, so that we at least make significant progress towards herd immunity, even if we don't reach it this year. Uh, and whether we reach it this year or not, or whether we vaccinate sufficient people 
uh, that need to be vaccinated to reach herd immunity or not depends on how quickly we get the vaccines in and how organized we are in actually getting them into people's arms. Now, we absolutely clear as, as business, we've done this under the umbrella of business for South Africa. It's been driven to a great extent by BUSA. that government needs to take the lead in this as they are taking the lead in it. But that we need to bring the best available resources and capacity in the country to bear to ensure that the end-to-end -end process from negotiation, negotiating for the vaccines, getting them in, storing them, distributing them, getting them into people's arms is done seamlessly and we have the capacity in the country and we're, so so certainly our appeal to government in the work we're doing with them is to utilize capacity that can be brought to bear by business all the expertise we have mobilized under the b4sa umbrella currently working on numerous work streams with government has been mobilized on a pro bono basis. So, so none, none of those experts, none of those professionals are charging for what they're doing. This is in the national interest. Business is not interested in any, certainly before I say that managing businesses intervention here is not interested in any tenders and business opportunities and so on. Those are managed by the National Department of Health they have issued tenders for logistics. Uh, they are procuring the vaccines and, and they must do that in a transparent, accountable way so that not just business and government itself, but the public has a confidence that this is being done well and we don't have another PPE experience that we had uh, last year uh, when the virus started. So... We have a number of structures working with the government. And the information we have, as late as this morning, actually, is that we're making good progress in uh, securing the vaccines, in uh, the bilateral negotiations the government is having with uh, the vaccine producers. And, and I'm not going to go into detail on that. The minister, I'm sure, if he feels... This is the appropriate forum to do that. Uh, I think it's his ambit to do that. But we believe that if we pull together, uh, if government is prepared to, as they have been up to now, but even to a greater extent, utilize capacity that business can bring to bear uh, uh, and, and uh, utilizes the capacity of business to manage an end-to-end -end process, to get the vaccine, to install them and get them into people's arms. I think we've made significant progress towards uh, vaccinating uh, pretty close to, if not at the level of herd immunity. Now, whether that is effective or not, given what Shabir says about the variants and so on, is a scientific matter and a medical matter. Uh, and, and I'm not, uh, I don't have the uh, uh, expertise to comment on that. But that should not stop us, irrespective of whether the different vaccines deal with the variant or not. That should not stop us from doing our best to vaccinate the number of people we need to vaccinate to reach herd immunity if everything else is equal. If because of the types of variants that pop up, uh, even though we reach vaccinate those numbers of people and we haven't broken the back of the vaccine to an, to an extent because of medical and scientific reasons, that's a, another story, but we should, that should not stop us from trying to vaccinate as many people as possible this year so that we, in the event that the vaccines do actually uh, work well against the variants, 
we don't find ourselves in a situation where we haven't vaccinated the number of people we need to vaccinate. Um, I think that the private sector is also has been quite keen, and we've we've indicated to government that we will bring to bear all available private sector infrastructure to administer the vaccines. So uh, the mining houses will bring their occupational health facilities to bear. Uh, uh, property owners t- have told me and have assured me that they will make available shopping centers if we need them. Uh, we've spoken to people like Gift of the Givers who have the capacity, who have the expertise to actually manage these things. They are prepared to come to the party to set up centers for, for vaccination. And we must utilize all of them. We must provide that the Department of Health is happy that conditions pr- that need to prevail to ensure that vaccinations are done properly in a healthy way and in an uh, efficacious way. We must utilize all those facilities uh, so that we can actually ensure that our people have a broad range of facilities to go to. We are awaiting from government, and and they're pretty close to it, to actually finalize the priority list for vaccination. The first phase is quite clear on on health workers, and and we're confident that we will have sufficient vaccines to vaccinate health workers pretty quickly soon, in the next month or two. Uh, and, And that subsequent to that, when we get into phase two in the next few months, uh, a priority list of uh, who gets vaccinated when, uh, determined by some sort of scientific and rational uh, criteria and methodology, so that everybody has confidence in that. Uh, and then, and and we've also indicated to government that if government gets in enough vaccines as quickly as possible, uh, private sector can buy those vaccines of government under the leadership of government without detracting from the priority list. But pri- certain sectors in the private sector could purchase the vaccines, reduces the load on government from a fiscal, fiscal point of view, and then take responsibility for vaccinating their employees and even take responsibility for vaccinating more than their employees. So those are the sorts of issues we engage in government in, in, in work. We integrate that we can. Where we can't integrate, we are aligning our forces and, and hopefully we will get this done together as a country. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kes. Uh, I think that's a very good contribution that you believe the private sector can come to the party, particularly in supply, logistics, and uh, distribution. Thank you very much for that contribution. Dr. Ronald, over to you. Many thanks, Maurice, and uh, thank you for hosting us this afternoon. It's uh, delighted to be here as a a WITS alumni, and uh, good afternoon to all our alumni colleagues and Honourable Minister. Um, I think uh, three uh, points to your highlight from my side. You know, my colleagues you are know, coming before Prof and you're know, the Minister of, um, and CARES have raised a number of the points already. But maybe three points worth hi- highlighting. I think the first one for us is that there's a, a clear clinical and economic imperative around COVID-19 vaccinations. I think you're all aware of the population health imperative uh, in reducing severe disease and hospitalization. We're all clear around it, uh, you're controlling the, the new variants and then you're helping us prevent the third wave. I think uh, there's obviously also the, the economic imperative around getting our local economy going and the global connectivity going against that you are able to tra- trade and you know, connect you know, with the, the rest of the planet. But perhaps you have two points that um, are less you know, clear in the, the environment at the moment and have not you know, popped up as, um, you know, you know, as, as markedly as they, they might have. I think yeah, the first one is you know, COVID has you know, significant additional costs on, on the healthcare system. So at least you know, from a Discovery Health perspective, Discovery Health has spent 
you know, all, you know, almost 5 billion rand on hospital admissions for COVID during the last year, spent over a billion rand in your pathology testing for COVID. And if you begin to you know, um, extrapolate that across you know, the public sector system, you can you understand the significant weight that your COVID has applied to the system. So certainly an imperative to get vaccinated on the back of your costs and associated with the, you know, the system as well. I think you know, there's also been you know, quite severe ramifications in terms of you know, seeing people you know, uh, accessing less care. So we've seen elective surgeries cancelled, we've seen screenings cancelled, um, you know, people putting off dental visits, oncology visits, and so on and so forth. So it's imperative for us to get you know, the system you know, back up and running so that you know, we can drive that preventive care and then you know, obviously can reduce the, the burden on the health system you know, in, terms of, in terms of COVID. Yeah, as my colleague uh, Kaz, Kaz yeah, rightly mentioned, that the, and yeah, the, the minister alluded to, to this as well, is yeah, speed is of the essence here. Yeah. So South Africa's program is obviously driven according to a, a three-phase rollout with the populations prioritised accordingly. Um, you know, so uh, it's imperative that we get our healthcare workers yeah, vaccinated first. That relieves significant yeah, pressure on the, on the healthcare system. As a second-order priority, um, but a very, very important priority is you know, important to get our, our elderly populations and our at-risk populations vaccinated as quickly as possible and get essential workers vaccinated so that you know, we can get the economy going again. And I think you know, for that, that reason, uh, I think if we were able to get through you know, phase two of the program by around about you know, mid-winter, we would at least have healthcare workers vaccinated, essential workers vaccinated, at-risk populations vaccinated. And really, I think it would have, um, you know, it would be a massive win, win for South Africa. And I know as both the public sector and the private sector, we're kind of galvanizing around this as a potential you know, target. So phase two done by you know, somewhere around you know, the, the middle of winter. Huge, huge win for us as a, a country, both clinically as well as economically. I think you know, the, the, the next point I would raise is around your know, pu public-private sector collaboration. So I think you know, the one thing that has manifested you know, throughout COVID and not only the vaccination program is the spirit of collaboration between the public sector and the private sector. So all the way from, you know, from you know, March, you know, end of February you know, last, last year, private sector, public sector have been working hand in hand around you know, responding to COVID, a range of your initiatives, and as, yeah, I think it's been re remarkable what we've achieved together during the course of the last year. And the vaccination program is no, no different. I think there's three elements of your public-private public collaboration around uh, yeah, the vaccine rollout. Yeah, the first one is the supply side, as, as I call it. So you'll know that um, <clears throat> the ministers appointed a vaccine acquisition task team under the leadership of Adrian Gore. Adrian reports directly into the minister around the vaccine acquisition task team, working hand-in-hand -hand to unlock supply uh, of vaccines globally. I think uh, yeah, that's been a, a very, very successful yeah, initiative and we're certainly seeing yeah, the fruits of that initiative begin to, to come to the fore now. I think yeah, the second part of the public-private collaboration, as Kaz alluded to, was the demand side. So the demand side is everything from education, knowledge building around vaccines, but also around throughput capacity, as we call it. And throughput capacity is building the capacity of our healthcare system to absorb these many millions of doses of vaccines that will you know, arrive in the country you know, shortly. Um, you know, by our, our estimates, so we need to be vaccinating at somewhere between 250,000 to 300,000 people a day in order to you know, get through the program at the, the pace we're aiming to get through. And that really requires both work, work on both the public sector front as well as on the private sector front. And then I think the third area of public-private collaboration is uh, funding uh, collaboration. Um, and your know, funding comes from a variety of sources. So National Treasury has led the, the funding of the, the program. And you know, as you would have seen in the budget your speech last week, has you know, allocated your know, significant funds to a successful rollout. National Treasury is then you know, supported by you know, the medical schemes who account for about your know, 17% of the, the adult population. And then, of course, you know, as you've seen you know, throughout the COVID program, business plays a really important role in, in, in funding, you know, both you know, for uh, your healthcare for their employees, but also your do do donor funding. So I think um, <clears throat> this you know, public-private you know, collaboration is, is quite exciting over the last year, year or so, manifesting once again in the vaccination program. And certainly you're proud to be, proud to be a part of this and you're working alongside our colleagues in government. Thank you. Thank you, Ron.
I really appreciate your contribution. Uh, again, uh, tremendous input that uh, the private sector can bring to the table. Stavros, go ahead, my brother. So, uh, Professor Khadebe, uh, Minister, other colleagues, um, it's always a great pleasure speaking at uh, WITS University events. It's my alma mater, so today is no exception. <clears throat> I'm going to augment a, a few of the points that uh, colleagues have made previously and hopefully add some provocations for the Q&A session. Uh, so le let me start off uh, firstly by, by saying in four days' time will be the anniversary, the one-year anniversary of when the first South African patient presented with uh, COVID, tested COVID positive. And since then, it's been an absolute roller coaster ride, as it has been. And uh, I need to say up front that there's no textbook and there are no real learnings that you can take out of previous pandemics and apply them. There's certain things you can. I mean, you can look at what we learned with SARS and MERS and the Spanish flu, but each pandemic has its own unique uh, characterization and manifestations, and each country's situation is, is different, not only from a resource point of view, but uh, how the pandemic presents and how it is managed in those particular countries. So you're largely left to your own devices uh, when you establish a strategy, and I think we've done that uh, particularly successfully in our country, recognising uh, some of the constraints that we've got and also recognising um, that we, we were one of the few countries that presented with this dominant variant that we're now experiencing and we had to manage a whole different set of dynamics. So the point I want to make up front is there is no textbook for this and you, you learn as you go along, you draw on previous experiences and the only thing you do know for a fact is that you're going to live in a highly fluid environment and we will continue to live in a highly fluid environment uh, for some time to come. Uh, Prof Mahdi made the point that, that COVID is going to be with us for, our, for the foreseeable future, certainly um, probably for, for uh, our lifespan anyway. And I should also make the point that coronaviruses are not new. They didn't present last year or two years or five years before that. They've been with us for some time. And of course, as you heard, these viruses mutate over a period of time. Uh, it is the nature of viruses as part of their survival that they tend to what we call upmutate. Um, and when they upmutate, that's their way of trying to survive. And usually when they upmutate, they become either more pathogenic or more contagious or both. And that's why it's so important to keep on top of the science at all times. But I should also make a point that we, we can never be in a position where we don't lead with science or we're not evidence driven. So the best way to manage these pandemics is to, manage, to, lead the, to let the science lead when you're doing this. Uh, if you become anecdotal, speculative, as we've seen in some other parts of the world, that's when you start running into problems. So acknowledging that I'm speaking to largely a business audience today, there are just five points that I want to make in, in my remarks. The, the first is, uh, by now widely quoted, is one of the best things that came, one of the best statements that came out of the World Economic Forum Davos uh, said, in, uh, in, in January this year, one of the CEOs stood up and said, the best economic recovery plan for the world is vaccinations, or vaccinating. And it's no different in our country. Uh, we need to vaccinate as many people as quickly as possible. That is the best economic recovery plan that we can institute. Of course, many people have debated, uh, are, are vaccine cost effective, where are we going to find the money? There's been a lot said in the press around some of the positioning and posture that Treasury took in the private sector and all the rest of it. So my colleague Ron 
who spoke before me and he's on this call, of course, has been working with a team of people in business for South Africa to determine as best as we understand it, what this will cost over a 12 month period. Now I say as best as possible because there are a number of various, it depends on the mix of one dose versus two dose vaccines that you use. It depends on the type of vaccine. It depends on the resources that get, uh, get, get consumed in each of the different uh, vaccine options. So as best as we can understand it, using various scenarios, it's going to cost us between 11 and 13 billion rand. If you want to understand the return on investment, last year, our economy lost 380 billion rand as a consequence of, of COVID. So 11 to 13 billion rand becomes a no-brainer. It's a rounding off error in the broader scheme of things. So costs and cost constraints are not the issue here for us. Uh, it's, it's a program that makes absolute sense. Uh, I should also hasten to add, some people are questioning, but uh, you know, do, do we have the capacity and do we have the capability? And that's where I think we need to place our focus and emphasis. Managing demand and supply is the most delicate balance that our country and the rest of the world is going to have to undertake. What I mean by that is there are significant global constraints for these vaccines. And um, let me dispel another myth. I know some people are saying that we, we started negotiating too late and we should have gone earlier. And that might well have been the case, right? But the, the fluidity of this environment could also have meant that we could have gone in early, landed 10 million doses of AstraZeneca Serum Institute, only to find out that as they're landing or just shortly after they land, that you get a new variant and you then have to go ahead and place the program on pause. Now, that what we experience now, no country would have anticipated, so we need to dispel that myth as well. You don't know when these variants are going to manifest. As I speak to you right now, there are over 4,000 variants, and you don't know which ones become more contagious, which become more pathogenic, as I said earlier. So what you need to do is you need to apply the greatest degree of circumspection and get your demand and supply right. Getting demand and supply right means that we need to have a clear and visible uh, su supply pipeline. So we know, and uh, Shabin made this point uh, earlier, we know that right now our country doesn't have a dearth of vaccines. We will have enough vaccines. That's not the problem. We have a timing issue. That's the, that's the issue here. We have a timing issue in quarter two. Why is quarter two so important? You've heard from many people. That's when you start edging towards the winter months. And we know what happens uh, with, uh, with, these, uh, with these viruses and how they behave. People tend to cuddle more, uh, uh, sorry, huddle and cuddle. <laughs> they do both. They're more in confined areas. They're not out as much. So the risk goes up and naturally the trajectory starts going up as well. So we have a problem in quarter two, and that's where the singular focus of both the private and the public sector is right now. We collaborate extensively with Minister Nkiza and his team, the Treasury colleagues. We are working to see what can be done to reschedule or accelerate some of the current supply pipeline as it, as it stands. The, 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 part, the pipeline, of course, is going to only be as good as our ability to vaccinate the population. So by our estimates, we're going to have to vaccinate over a sustained period of time, around 250,000 people per day. Uh, I won't go into uh, there's quite an extensive model that's been developed for this. I won't go into it in detail. But that will tell you that this is the most complex and by far in, in size or scale, the biggest initiative or program our country would have launched post-democratically, post -democratic, post if not pre-democratically as well. It's going to require... Uh, mobilizing every resource in the private and public sector 
to enable this mass vaccination to take place. It's, it's going to mean, as Kay said earlier, that we utilize all the resources that reside in the private sector in business. So this means getting non-medical facilities actively involved in the vaccination program. Many, uh, many sectors and or businesses, whether it's mining or retail or any others, I see John Baladakis from Pick and Pays on here. It means mobilizing all of those resources to be able to vaccinate in scale, at an industrial scale level, on a daily basis over a sustained period of time. And that is where we as a country now need to shift our focus to how can we get, because we're not going to have a problem down the line with the number of vaccines. We'll have millions of doses available. The thing is, we need to marry up these millions of doses with our ability to do 250,000 vaccines a day. And that's got to become, I feel, singular focus of the country, whilst we, of course, work in the background to see whether we can reschedule or accelerate some of the supply. Let me handle two further topics and then I'll end. Uh, the, the first is that a, a lot of the misleading comments, the myths, the rumors don't assist any, any program anywhere in the world. So let, let's just look at a few facts that are uh, things that we would be responding to, to concerned citizens. The, the first is vaccines are not new. We've been using vaccines since Louis Pasteur's time. And they are unequivocally the most effective mechanism or means known to humanity for preventing disease. Other than clean running water, there's nothing else that is more effective than vaccines. And vaccines by and large have, have and have an excellent safety record, including COVID vaccines. So the world has rolled out around 70, 75 million doses of COVID vaccine since, uh, since the first uh, dose was administered in, uh, in late December. And the, 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 the side effects run into the zero comma zeros. Okay. Have there been side effects? Most definitely they have. But to place it in perspective, they are minimal in the overall scheme of the benefit that gets provided, the, the public good that gets provided. What have those side effects been? As you would expect, there have been some anaphylactic reactions. Those have been treated as you would anyone that you're vaccinating that develops anaphylaxis. A further concern is how is it possible that we delivered a vaccine in 301 days? It's, it's a record time, so we must have cut corners. So we need to dispel that myth as well. The reason amongst others, and I'm not gonna give you all the reasons, is that firstly, we are not necessarily using new technologies. The adenoviral vector technology is a technology we've had previously. We haven't had to establish that technology from scratch. So it means tweaking these technologies. And when you tweak them, you're able to do that quite swiftly, as we will need to tweak further variants that come about. So this is not a once-off event. This is going to be an annual event that we're going to have to manage like we manage a flu vaccine. And we're going to use existing and new technologies to tweak these vaccines as we move forward. So the other reason, of course, and there are technologies like the mRNA technology, which have been able to develop a lot quicker, quicker than the vectoral-based technologies. So that's one reason that we've been able to move as a global community swiftly. The second reason is that we, we've learned different regulatory pathways. So you have these rolling over regulatory submissions, which enable you to go through the same robust and, uh, and stringent re regulatory requirements is not a single one that's been left out. And when companies submit their dossiers for assessment by the drug regulatory agencies, SAPRA in our case here in South Africa, it's literally car loads of information that goes in. That hasn't changed. It's just the regulatory pathways that we've been able to make more efficient and the time and use of of independent reviewers, and I stress the word independent, that should give everyone a lot more comfort that these reviews 
and the reviewers are independent people and they don't even know half the time who they are dealing with. It's, it's done on an independent basis. So that should give, I think, a lot of comfort. Using vaccines for many decades now, they are safe to use. We haven't picked up major, major problems in 75 odd million doses. They're a very effective way of managing or preventing disease. And there is independent review that takes place. Okay, let me end off with my last point. And that is a point around local capacity and capability. Very briefly, there are, and, and I'm, I'm sort of maybe oversimplifying this, but there, there are six steps involved in the manufacture of a vaccine. The first is a manufacture of the, what we call the active ingredient, uh, the antigen. So that's the thing that's going to cause the actual uh, immunogenicity or it, it, will, uh, it will cause the immunological effect that you want it to cause. So that's the first step. We don't have that capability yet in South Africa, but we have a capability, um, as, as I think the minister might have mentioned, to backwardly integrate into that capability. That makes you self-sufficient, not only for COVID, but the other vaccines. We consume 14 million vaccines a year in our country, mainly pediatric vaccines. So we need to develop that backward integrated cap uh, capacity and capability in our country. So that's step one. Step two is a formulation. That means you take a formula and it's like make it, baking a cake and you mix it up and it goes into solution. It's done under very different conditions as you would expect to baking a cake. Of course, these are all very stringent, aseptic, sterile, sterile uh, facilities that make these products. The third step, once you formulate it, is you then fill. It's, it's called, so you actually fill a dose, uh, a pre-filled syringe, a vial, whatever it might be that gets filled. That then gets sealed. And the next step after that is a visual inspection, which is a very sophisticated and complex thing. These are, these are medicines that you're administering, injectable medicines you're administering sometimes directly into the bloodstream. In the case now of, of a vaccine, it's going to be intramuscular, but uh, it, the, these require extremely sterile conditions and visual inspection is a critical element to that. And then you get the packaging and the labeling. Now, steps five, sorry, steps two to six, we can do in this country. And there, there are two producers that can do steps two to six. Aspen, where I work, is one of them. And Aspen's got the capacity to manufacture over 300 million doses at this point in time. And then our colleagues from BioVac can do steps three to six. At this point in time, they will go, they'll be backwardly integrate into steps two. So they'll be able to do steps two to six in time. They have a much smaller capacity of around 20 to 30 million doses. So what, where am I going to with all of this? I'm going to the need for us to have a proper coordinated and coherent localization strategy for vaccines, pharmaceuticals, and medical equipment. It cannot be that year on year, the trade deficit in pharmaceuticals continues to grow. So as I speak to you right now, as we've gone through many, many leaders in our country saying we've got to be more self-sufficient, we've got to develop capacity and all the rest of it, the, the trade statistics are telling us something completely different. Even in the last 12 months, alarmingly and, uh, and, and very worrisome is that we have further grown the trade deficit. We now need a concerted effort, starting from this month, to localize, make sure we've got more efficient localization policies that get implemented and local procurement has to be put at the forefront. As it is in the economic recovery and uh, uh, rec recovery plan of the country, but it's at an implementation level that we are failing. So, Professor Khadebe, hopefully I've given you a further overview on A, the private sector's role, B, where some of the challenges reside, and C, where I think we need to be placing emphasis moving forward for the next 12 months. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Stavros. We really appreciate your input. Uh, I'm going to move to questions uh, because we've got a, 
half an hour left now. Start with you, uh, with uh, Stavros from uh, Public while you're still there. Very quickly now, just to respond. One person says, how quickly will Aspen be able to produce 300 million dollars of uh, 300 million doses of the J and J vaccine? How many will go to South Africa? Where will other doses go to? So that's a question directly to you while you're still uh, talking about. Thank you. Go for it. Okay, Prof, thank, thanks for that question, which I can only partly respond to, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, the reason is that the, this vaccine is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. They have contracted Aspen as a contract manufacturer to manufacture the vaccine. So this is what I can say, and the rest, unfortunately, is for Johnson & Johnson to respond to. Uh, I can say the following, that Aspen is one of seven sites globally that have been selected by Johnson & Johnson, the only African company, and the way I understand it, the only one in the Southern Hemisphere selected by J&J to contract manufacture. So we're very proud of the country's scientific, technical, and manufacturing capabilities. I think that's a starting point. It's a good thing. Secondly, we have indicated that we can manufacture up to 300 million doses of the J&J vaccine. It doesn't mean that J&J will take all 300 million. They might contract for a lower amount. We don't know that yet because that is an ongoing discussion. As I said, a lot of these things are fluid. The third thing is that Aspen is probably going to be J&J's &J, biggest contract manufacturer. And J&J have indicated that this manufacturing will be for the African continent and beyond. How that gets configured or um, it, it gets um, allocated, that is for J&J to decide. I know that they are in discussions with our government, with the AU platform. But ultimately, um, what we need to look at is that the continent, at very least, is making its own product albeit that I cannot give you at this point in time the details, J&J &J will have to do so. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Professor Madi, there's this question around uh, that we need to be more independent in terms of biotechnology. And the pandemic has exposed our lack of capacity of biotechnology. What will be done to address this? Yeah, so I, what needs to be done, like I said, it's not just uh, any single partner that is responsible for what exists in South Africa. And I think just to follow on Stravos, we need to be clear that uh, setting up a manufacturing facility, which goes from the full scale of, uh, of discovery right through to manufacture, is not something that is going to be accomplished by any stretch of the imagination in a period of 12 to 24 months. In fact, we don't even have the regulatory framework in South Africa to, over, to oversee that sort of development. So for when it comes to COVID-19, unfortunately, we need to be circumspect in terms of what we're able to achieve over what period of time. Uh, but more long term, it really speaks to there being strategic interventions and not just again on a part of government. These strategic interventions need to take place at a level of our universities as well as the private sector. And when you see what happens in many high-income countries, and I think BioNTech is, in fact, is an example of it, is that these are partnerships that are established between academia and private uh, institutions. And that is what really lends itself to being able to achieve this sort of goals of getting South Africa to be uh, not just uh, self-sustainable when it comes to vaccines generally, and, uh, but uh, to basically be a major role player at a global level. For South Africa to set up a manufacturing facility for any vaccines that only serves the country, unfortunately, it will be highly uncompetitive. Uh, the reason why Serum Institute of India exists and the reason why it is competitive is not because of the margins of the profit, uh, but rather because of the quantity of vaccine. And that is required on African continent, but it really requires a strategic intervention at the level of uh, academia, the private sector, as well as the public sector in terms of government. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Minister, uh, there's a question here about what is government going to do uh, about this big need for education to dispel the conspiracies around uh, COVID-19 vaccines? There's so many conspiracy theories around the 
And then maybe while you're at it, it looks like the press is not aware where uh, these vaccines are being given to health workers and they want to interview them, maybe may direct them in the right direction. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, I've picked up quite a number of questions. Uh, you will indicate which ones uh, I would need to respond to, but uh, on those two, uh, let me say that uh, we, we would need to liaise with the media to uh, arrange for, um, so that they can cover the areas where uh, people are being vaccinated. Uh, it's not really um, in secret. It's, such, it's that uh, uh, we just need to arrange. I think that that, that should not be difficult. Then um, the other, the few other points that have, <coughs> have come out here. I just want to start by. Go ahead, Minister. Uh, if, so, yes, I just want to deal with a few points that were raised by uh, Professor Madi. Uh, firstly, that uh, we, we have had this variant, which is an, something that was really unknown, and therefore it started spreading. It has spread to a few other countries now. Uh, the last day I checked, they gave me a list of uh, just over 10 countries, about 12 or so. And so uh, the question we've asked ourselves is, how frequently is this va variant going to be changing? It's a bit difficult to know, but we have noticed in the past few days, even California has spotted their own variant and some uh, media reported that it might even be more dangerous than the South African one. So you will find that these, these uh, variants are going to be popping up in a number of areas. Yes, indeed, I, we are also discussing with the manufacturers on the issue of uh, uh, looking at what can be done with the current vaccine so that they are more effective against future variants. There'll be some work also which will be announced in the next, I think, tomorrow or day after in relation to this work on vaccines. So we will actually <clears throat> find that what we start with as, a, as an assumption will later be changed because of the new information that will be coming through. We are all concerned about the possibility of a, th a third uh, wave or a resurgence uh, after the Easter's. Well, because of Easter's, because of the winter, because of the uh, fact that people might be feeling that things are, you know, more relaxed and so on. So we still have to insist that uh, people must continue to utilize the uh, containment measures, use of masks, sanitation, and so on, and not relax, and not uh, relax because we are going to run into a problem with uh, uh, with 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 the with the uh, with the, uh, the, 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 the 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 viral infection is going to spread anyway, more so as we go towards winter. So. Uh, <clears throat> Then uh, there are a few other points which uh, I just picked up. Uh, your point was about how to dispel some of the myths. It's important for us to continue to send information, share it, and also what we do, uh, if we pick up fake news, we also send it back as fake news so that uh, on tweets and on WhatsApp groups it can be picked up. But also uh, we believe that the uh, uh, you know, fact that president was in the forefront to take the vaccine has helped on a lot of people. And we're seeing in a number of uh, health workers, many of the, the top managers, professors, we're encouraging them to also go so that uh, uh, many people must be able to see what's happening. When the uh, next phase is open, we will also be encouraging more of the leaders in various sectors to make themselves available so as to just reassure everyone about the need for, uh, you know, that in fact there's no uh, you know, need to fear the vaccination. So uh, we have seen in amongst the health workers, we've also in, uh, you know, said some of the uh, trade unions and so on must also be seen because some of them are in any case are health workers, but to say those who are in the leadership must also be visible as such so that that helps. Those who are in charge must also be seen so that those who are uh, you know, under their supervision must feel kind of comfortable about it. But it requires a continuous discussion and communication at that kind of level. Then um, the other point that uh, was raised was uh, uh, about <clears throat> why do we roll out the, the uh, vaccine as a, uh, a, 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 three, a phase 3B trial. Uh, the reality is that we needed to start the vaccination. So we wanted to find where are the vaccines that are available. And the vaccines that were available were those that were in fact had been initially earmarked for the vaccines, but they were all perfectly normal. They had been tested. They had been already uh, approved for the trial purposes and they were not being used. And so we actually went to uh, engage uh, 
the uh, manufacturer for that. This is mainly because of this point that uh, we were ready with AstraZeneca early and then uh, uh, with the new results that came out, it caused us to actually go and re rethink about it. So that is the one issue that uh, uh, really kind of disturbed the flow of how we're going to do things. But we were ready, <clears throat> we would have been able to utilize as many of them as, as possible. Now we have to reconsider the strategy and as we do so, we do so on a continuous basis because as we sit now, um, we are targeting that by um, end of March, we should have at least received about 1.1 million of those uh, vaccines. Uh, some of them, we expect that they should have come from Pfizer and then others would have come from Johnson & Johnson. This process, this process means that uh, you can't get more vaccines beyond that number up until end of March. Then we expect more vaccines to start in April, May, June. And so those are the numbers we're working on. It would then explain firstly why those who are asking why are we not just pushing up the numbers. The, the vaccines aren't ready as, uh, as yet. They are coming in the num in the quantities that they are coming. And the 80,000 per week or uh, in two weeks came because of the, pre the preparation that had to be made to make them fit uh, ready for um, uh, uh, for 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 uh, to, to be used in South Africa, they've got to be packaged. They've got to be labeled. They've got to be you know all sorts of things that need to be done. That's what is actually the rate limiting step in terms of the numbers that come to South Africa. So uh, as uh, the uh, Johnson and Johnson will actually be starting to release most of their manufactured uh, uh, vaccines, uh, both from uh, uh, some overseas uh, venues with manufacturing companies uh, abroad or local in South Africa. So we therefore believe that uh, uh, things will start flowing at that point. But uh, we've tried everything to try and get earlier access to vaccines. Uh, this is how best we could actually do it. <clears throat> and so that's why we, 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 we have them in the way that they're, that, 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 that they're being released. So with all of that, um, it means, therefore, we expect that there should be an acceleration of the vaccination around uh, 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 April, June, uh, April, May to, to, to June. That at that point, we are actually negotiating much higher numbers of vaccines. Now, because the uh, uh, the manufacturers have not committed yet onto those numbers, even though we've got numbers that we think are going to be a good, uh, you know. Uh, good, good, good numbers for starting, it makes it a bit difficult <clears throat> to announce those numbers. We need them to commit because uh, we've seen that uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, dynamics in the way that uh, all of these uh, negotiations happen. So we need them to commit and then we can announce properly. But what we are working on are much larger numbers of vaccines that should be available at that time. There won't be enough because the whole, the whole world is having the same challenge of the bottlenecks during the manufacturing. So the large number of uh, vaccines uh, will come also in quarter three and quarter four. So that uh, will be the same situation even uh, in South Africa. So uh, the, the, the speed with which we want to increase the numbers will, uh, will actually pick up in up April to June, and then will also pick up further in uh, June, in, in, in July to August, and August to, uh, to uh, July to September and thereafter. So that, that, that is what happens. So we will also be working together with the private sector at the level of uh, where uh, to do the vaccinations. The offers that will come from mining industry, for example, those are being discussed because uh, when we get to a particular point where there's a setting of uh, um, uh, workers that are in the same area, makes it easy to set up next to those areas. Of course, we have to also balance it up with the fact that there are communities uh, because most of the people would come from work and then there'll be communities. So that work is actually being done. We will need quite a number of uh, vaccinations to be done on a day. Uh, we estimated about 300,000, but in fact, uh, it may not be like that immediately. It will have to build up to that, uh, to, uh, to that amount. Some people have asked the question why the teachers were not in the, put in the first group. Actually, what we were focusing on are those who are in the health sector immediately. And then the teachers are actually in the priority group in immediately uh, as we finish the health workers, teachers, uh, you know, and all of those who are working in the community setting. 
those are the areas that uh, uh, of people who have got a likelihood of contracting the infection quite, quite early and those with comorbidities. So all of that um, will, be, will be looked at uh, on the phase two. But what we're hoping as well to do is that uh, if we start in, uh, April, in February, should have been February, March, um, uh, April, would have been the the end of the third month, and therefore we would have started the the uh, first the <clears throat> the um, the second wave at the end of uh, uh, in at the beginning of of May. That's why you've had the president saying we're looking towards the end of April. We're trying by all means to push it closer as close as possible, so that we should be increasing the numbers of people who are getting uh, uh, vaccines uh, by that time, uh, where when we've got uh, those challenges that uh, uh, a possible resurgence is likely to be coming through. So those uh, uh, are going to be the, the issue. Some, the question of other private sector participation, we have spoken to medical schemes and they are actually quite on board and uh, through uh, Business for South Africa, we're also involving other businesses to work together, uh, mainly at the point of the uh, financing of the vaccines, the medical schemes are gonna participate and we're also, uh, uh, seeking additional support from the private sector. Uh, the detailed mechanism of how, mechanisms of how that can be done are being worked upon, as we have had. <clears throat> There's a lot of uh, people already involved in this kind of work. So uh, we expect that uh, some of the uh, vaccination will take place on uh, sites that are managed or recommended by the private sector, and that we will be refining and improving as we move along. What I want to also agree with is what... Uh, 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 Stavros has raised around the localization strategy is quite critical that South Africa should be able to manufacture its own vaccines and uh, also other pharmaceutical uh, uh, products uh, uh, so that we can produce as much as possible from uh, within our own country. So in the future, we run into challenges. We're at least able to deal with our own uh, uh, own supply as it were. At the moment, uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, there's no manufacturing capacity in the continent, and uh, there's a portion of it that's being done by Aspen. Now, this is also risky to the continent to actually rely on the other different continents uh, for purposes of uh, its own uh, uh, needs. And that means that, uh, you know, even in future, this is something that you need to find a way to, to, to correct so that uh, we can at least say the, pro the, 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 um, the continent is able to uh, look after itself. So we will be able to increase the rollout at the point when we start having more supplies. The real issue that's going to determine how quickly we are able to do this is how quickly do the manufacturers uh, supply. Now, when we sign the contract, uh, contracts with them, they have, for example, said uh, we must always remember they might not be able to meet some of the uh, numbers that they're committed to uh, because of various factors. And so uh, we are not even able to levy any penalty against that because this is a problem the whole uh, you know world is actually facing where uh, there are just somewhere uh, difficulties and bottlenecks in the process so those uh, are some of the challenges we want to face but we expect a much larger number of uh, vaccines around um, uh, by the time we get to may and in our own discussions we're trying to target to get at least um, a minimum of 10 million but whether in fact we are able to get that confirmed uh, if you combine all of the players, uh, we will then be able to see once we've got uh, all the um, all the uh, contracts uh, contract signed and are in place. So if I can just hold it at that, uh, I think we, we can uh, uh, hold it at that for now. If there are any new questions, uh, we can then come back. Thank you very much, uh, uh, thank Professor Hader. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Mr. Kuovadi, uh, 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 Kes, let, let, let's give you a question here regarding, uh, as you indicated, you've been involved with this whole journey with government uh, uh, on, 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 since the COVID started and then the vaccine now. What, what lessons really you, you can say we need to pick up in order to be ready and be well prepared for future pandemics? Well, uh, well, a couple of lessons. One, let me just pick up on the localization issue. So yeah. in the early stages of the pandemic, we imported to virtually all of our PPE. 
because we weren't manufacturing PPE in the country and we needed to get PPE in urgently. During the course of last year, we worked on seeing what we can do locally. And we now, during that period, probably developed 25 odd medium-sized manufacturers actually manufacturing different types of PPE in the country. And they are continuing to do so. They are being supported at the moment by probably South Africa and they're on a platform there. So, so I think that one of the lessons is that we can actually get local manufacturing going, provided we sort out some regulatory issues and we sort out some issues related to us becoming more competitive and so on. And we are working quite hard with the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition to actually, off the back of the PPE experience, develop uh, localization and local manufacturing. The second issue, lesson we can learn, and, and unfortunately, we only do this under situations of crises and severe crises at that. We have worked very well, not just with government, but with social partners, labor and community through NEDLAC. I mean, at the beginning of COVID, NEDLAC established a rapid response task team on which we all sit. And that task team has resolved issues ranging from Uh, Cass, your bandwidth is low. Maybe switch off your camera. Uh, to the tours and UIF issues to uh, support for businesses. And okay, support for businesses and, and uh, workers and so on. So I think that the lesson is that if we put our ideological issues aside for a while, we can actually have them in all smooth sailing. It still is not all smooth sailing. That may not number of issues that we still working with, with government. I think that instead of what we're doing is we're looking for how we can actually solve for government in particular on the vaccine side, but on the pandemic side, since it started with all social partners. And then I think that we need to, you know, throughout the pandemic and now with the vaccines, you know, during the pandemic last year, we had close on to 400 people working under the B4SA platform, experts, professionals, all on a pro bono basis. So, you know, business people put their shoulders to the wheel during this period. And I think we need to recognize that. So, you know, this whole thing that we have, this rhetoric, business is the patriotic and all that sort of stuff. We need to move beyond that. And we need to see what caused us to come together as a country during this pandemic, even currently under the vaccine program, pick up those lessons and do that in, you know, now we need to, as the president said last night, we now need to concentrate on the economy. Well, let's concentrate in the economy with some of the focus and let's take the hard decisions and let's get our country onto a growth path. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kes. Uh, let me go to uh, Roland. You, Kes, uh, I think your bandwidth is a bit uh, low. Ro 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 Ron, Ron. Uh, you, you mentioned funding. Uh, uh, how do you see funding for the future vaccine being played out? To what extent should the private sector be involved in the funding uh, of the vaccines? Yeah, thank you, Maurice. Uh, yeah, I think as the, the minister has rightly pointed out, uh, yeah, the funding is yeah, primarily driven by National tre Treasury and then yeah, supported by the, the medical scheme industry as well as your yeah, private, private business. But I think it is important to point out that yeah, we need to think about funding as a potential multi-year funding across the program. As we know, it looks like um, boosters will come into the mix you know, over the, you know, the, the course of the next you know, few years. Um, so we need to think about not only this year's funding, next year's funding, and potentially you know, funding you know, years after that. So it needs to be a sort of a sustainable you know, fund, funding model in, in, in the long term. Um, 
The vaccine is uh, now being legislated, or vaccines and vaccination is legislated as a prescribed minimum benefit. Um, as a result of that, medical schemes are obligated to fund uh, for vaccines and vaccination for their for their members. Um, you know, so that will be a legal requirement for for medical schemes, and you know, medical schemes would obviously be more than you know, happy to 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 fund fund this for their their members, given the. Uh, clinical and the economic uh, benefits of the the vaccination your program, and then I think you're uh, obviously you uh, through the B4SA structures and my colleagues your CAS and Stavros you're know, working with a range of your know, businesses around your other your know, potential your know, funding you know, mechanisms either for employees or on a on a donor basis. Um, so you know, lots of opportunity for us to collaborate on uh, funding both in the short term as well as in the medium term. Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. Um, I'm left with six minutes, so I'm going to give you a, each one of you closing remarks, starting with the minister. And you can look at the questions because we've sent uh, questions through to you. Maybe there's one you would like to respond to uh, during your closing remarks. Uh, I would like to give you that opportunity. Uh, please go ahead, start, uh, minister, and uh, have closing remarks now, given the fact that uh, we are have six minutes to go now before half past five. No, thank you very much. Uh, just a few uh, of the remainder of the questions. One was, uh, why didn't we get uh, Johnson & Johnson from the word go? I think it should be remembered that uh, when we were dealing with uh, the, uh, the, the well, by the time we got to us the beginning of this year, we hadn't really received all the full results. And so we got the results a bit, a, a bit late. And so it was important for us to wait for the results. As you have seen that, uh, Although we had banked on AstraZeneca, uh, but in fact, uh, we had resulted made us uh, to, to change course. Uh, some people have asked why not uh, start AstraZeneca. Uh, uh, in, a, in a gamble, uh, we, we have said that our uh, scientists must sit down and give us a sense of how we can take this forward. Uh, at the moment, uh, the batch that we had received will be disposing of and selling to Cohen, uh, assist in various parts of the continent where they have no problems of the of the <coughs> variant. Uh, we appreciate um, the uh, uh, interest that has come from all health workers. The last I checked, we had been we had more than 600,000 who had registered on the um, electronic uh, vaccine uh, database. Uh, we do know that not all of them will have received uh, 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 you know, contacts to say come for vaccination because of the large number. We also appreciate the support from the private sector that uh, we should all be working on this uh, together with the private sector uh, as we are going to look at the uh, details of the plans of where we will be collaborating. I think the long and short of it for us is that uh, we need to keep the message strong about the use of uh, mask, uh, uh, sanit uh, sanitizers, hand washing and distancing for, through, for the, the rest of the year. We need to use that because uh, it's going to be very difficult to, uh, you know, uh, prevent a, a resurgence unless we do so. The vaccines will work, but uh, they will not work immediately because many people are still without vaccines. So we need to work together to deal with that situation. We also need to work very hard to remove the fears, anxieties, and all the myths about the vaccines because the vaccines are very much uh, what the whole world is going through. So it's important for our own citizens to participate in the vaccination program. We need all leaders, we need all sectors, we need everybody to actually support the whole program of vaccination. And let's be patient with the program because it's starting slowly because of the limits in the availability of the vaccines. Later on, we'll be increasing the numbers. And at that point, we'll be able to see that more uh, people can actually have access to the vaccines. In the meantime, let's continue to use mass distancing and uh, hand washing and prevent the spread of COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Prof, you want to do your closing remarks? And uh, there's lots of questions that we're given, uh, sent to you, Prof. If there's one or two that you want to use this time to answer, then you're welcome to do so. Yeah, thanks, Maurice. I tried to answer many of the questions online, so I'm not going to repeat what I've uh, okay. written online. Uh, I think the main issue for me is that uh, even though we might not have the best vaccines that we would have desired to be able to uh, bring about a complete interruption in terms of transmission of the virus, the vaccines that we do have, uh, certainly all of them, and probably including the AstraZeneca vaccine, are basically are tools that will be able to protect against severe disease and death. 
Uh, and if we can protect those that are most vulnerable to, from be, to that are most vulnerable for being hospitalized due to COVID and that are most vulnerable to dying from COVID, if we can get adequate penetration of vaccine into that specific uh, demographic, uh, we pretty much could probably uh, go back to a relatively normal lifestyle, even with COVID in our midst circulating. So I think, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it really requires a much more reflective approach in terms of what we're trying to achieve, uh, not just as a country, but probably on the continent. Uh, and we basically need to try to make optimal use of the tools that we've currently got available. And it has to be a very measured approach rather than being a blunt tool. Yes, we can vaccinate 40 million people if we vaccinate 250,000 people per day by the end of the year. But the bottom line is that it's going to probably serve very little value to vaccinate 40 million people when probably only 10 million of those would actually derive any sort of meaningful benefit from the vaccine. So we really need to ask ourselves what exactly we are trying to achieve as we roll out the vaccine. And again, to mention what I mentioned earlier, it is that we need to recalibrate about our thinking of the pandemic, as well as what we can do achieve with COVID-19 vaccines. Thank you very much, Prof, uh, with your closing remarks. Cass, uh, switch off yeah. your, your video because your bandwidth is a bit uh, worrying. I something. should be better now, uh, Maurice, oh. I hope so. All right. Okay. No, uh, on your, on so just in conclusion, just tell, let me deal with one question in the chat about why private sector is leaving the logistics to government to distribute the vaccines and so on. We're not. Government decided that on phase one for the healthcare workers, they will distribute the vaccines, which they are doing. But government has also issued open tenders for logistics for the rest of the vaccine rollout. Uh, private sector, we've got a specific work stream of private sector people together with government working on the logistics for the rollout for the cold store uh, and, and we ensuring that we work with government, bring in private sector capacity to ensure that the rollout is smooth and private sector capacity and infrastructure is utilized. So just to clarify that. And then finally, just, I, I think that, look, we, we've made mistakes along the way. Let's not kid ourselves. Uh, I think there are some things we could have done better, including government. Uh, but, you know, we, we are in a situation where the priority now has got to be, and we've got to focus on getting as many vaccines in as possible, getting them in as quickly as possible within the context of, or within the constraints of uh, uh, the manufacturer's supplying them to us as quickly as possible, and then getting them into arms as quickly as possible. And that's what government and business are working together on currently, and we will bring the best resources and capacity to bear to do that, because if we can't achieve that, then we've got some serious problems in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. I uh, uh, like uh, the idea of speeding up the vaccination rollout and the uh, the business sector has got the capacity to really fast track this. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on. Uh, Ron. Yeah, many thanks, uh, Maurice. I mean, uh, just to echo all of the sentiments by my colleagues on this uh, your webinar. I think yeah, for me, uh, you know, yeah, the, the, the most important thing is that you know, we're able to accelerate the progress of our uh, you know, national vaccination program. As the Honourable Minister mentioned, you know, we have a, a good pipeline of vaccines here, particularly in quarter three and quarter four, you know, beginning to manifest. Uh, we've now got to join forces, both your know, public and private, to put the capacity in place so that you know, we're, we're able to you know, vaccinate as many people as possible on a daily basis. You know, as I mentioned you know, earlier on, you know, the target is somewhere around you know, 250,000 to 300,000 know, people vaccinated daily. We've seen other countries achieve uh, those sorts of levels, a country like Israel, achieving up to 160,000 vaccinations a day on a population of 8 million people, the UK up to 400,000 vaccinations a day. So there's, there's no reason that yeah, South Africa can't achieve that with a good uh, public and private yeah, collaboration on this initiative. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, Stavros. Ma Maurice, thanks very much. Uh, I, I'm just going to make three very brief closing remarks to some of the questions that I think are, are aimed at me. Um, 
The first is where do we stand with therapeutics? Of course, we've got vaccines which are preventative and then you've got therapeutics that treat the condition. Uh, colleagues on this call would have noted that we have in some instances successfully repurposed older medicines um, to, to provide some therapeutic efficacy against, against the COVID virus. Uh, probably the best known example is uh, a, a much older corticosteroid. These are st steroid products, uh, cortisone-based uh, steroids. They, um, we would have seen uh, that one of these products uh, um, has, has, has demonstrated a 30 to 35 percent reduction of mortality in severe to critically ill COVID patients. So you've got this group of repurposed medicines. These are much older medicines indicated for a particular label use. And then as you go along and you learn more and more about the, the disease, you do find that these repurposed medicines have a particular indication or use in, in treating COVID patients. Of course, there are many other drugs that have been uh, earmarked as potential, uh, potentially repurposed medicines the only thing I want to stress about repurposing drugs is you need to have a, a clinically evidenced um, proof that these, these drugs actually work. There's a lot of anecdotal stories. I'm not going to go into ivermectin and all the others, but whatever we do in, in treating patients must be evidence-led because the minute you deviate from the science, you end up probably creating a bigger problem than anticipated. So we've got to balance the need for urgency with proper evidence-led science in making decisions on repurposed medicines. There's, of course, a number of other drugs that are, are candidate drugs that are under investigation at the moment. Many of these belong to a class of drugs called MABs, monoclonal antibodies. These are still under investigation, um, and some of them are, are uh, in phase three trials, actually. So the point here is, as we learn more about this disease, the, the better we're going to be able to apply therapeutics futuristically. Then uh, my, my point two and three, I'm going to combine into one, and, and it speaks to the private and public sector working together. I think um, many colleagues on this call have demonstrated that there's, there's a good and robust working relationship um, between the two sectors. But more importantly, I think there's an acknowledgement that no one sector can deliver the solution for the country. It's going to require all hands on deck. It's going to require private and public sector working together across multiple sectors, multiple communities. That's how big and daunting the challenge is. And we can only do this if we work together. And uh, the experience of the private sector thus far has been that there's an excellent working relationship. We sit on the National COVID Vaccine Coordinating Committee. There, there are three of us that sit on that. It's Martin Kingston, myself, and Melanie de Costa. And that is probably the nexus uh, from which all the other initiatives and programs roll out from that particular coordinating structure. So the best thing that we can do, I think, is, ac is, is um, communicate to all our constituencies concisely, accurately, and give the most up-to-date information um, at all times because um, misleading statements and myths, etc., only serve to undermine the overall program, which is really difficult enough to implement. If we have to time with, with sort of uh, myths, then it's, it's not going to make this a really daunting easier. So I think... The two sectors working together and, and having where necessary and where possible joint communication and giving accurate, concise and up-to-date information is as critical as the vaccines that we're going to administer. Because if we have a big stay away for whatever reason, based on myth or speculation, then you're not going to get the, to the numbers that we need to, to vaccinate. And remember, we only safe if everybody is safe. So accurate communication and information is critical to achieving that end objective. Thanks very much, uh, Maurice. It's been a great pleasure seeing you again.
and participating in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stavros. Let me take this opportunity to thank all the panelists. Uh, if we were in a live event, I would have said clap hands for all of them because they've done extremely well. And uh, thank, special thanks to Honorable Minister. We know how busy you are. Uh, we are supporting you we, with all the tremendous work that you have, you're doing. Uh, please, as a business school, we, if any help we can give you, we, we are available. Give us a shout. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Madi, uh, our leading expert in this field. Uh, Cass, very much so really appreciate the, the role of the business. It's critical in our, in our, in our country. Ron, thank you very much. All right, that's how the uh, seminar ends on the challenges and opportunities uh, that are found in the rollout of uh, the uh, vaccine in South Africa. And uh, of course, uh, we're going to take a break when we wrap up the program.